All right, everybody, thanks for coming along to my talk. My name is Noel Welsh. I'm a consultant at Underscore. I'm uh, giving this talk for my colleague, Adam, who unfortunately couldn't make it over here. So if you spot any errors or faults in the talk, they're all Adam's fault. If you think it's a good talk, it's obviously my delivery. Just keep that in mind. So what I want to talk about today, um, here's the, the outline. I want to talk about that way problems can get into our code through um, using the primitive types, things like int, string, when they're not appropriate. And then look at some ways that we can mitigate against these issues. So looking at uh, techniques for defining types that have more precise meaning, ways we can define functions so they only work over the intended input and output. And then um, looking at what are called refinement types and opaque types. So sections two and three should be things that you can easily use in your own code. Section four is a library you can add to your code, but you uh, might find some challenges adding it in. It's a little bit of a departure from what most people are used to. And section five is something that's in currently a Scala improvement process, SIP. So it's not something we can use now, but hopefully something we'll be able to use in the relatively near future. All right, so first, let's look at evil. What is evil? Evil is something profoundly wicked or malevolent, according to the dictionary I looked at, or maybe the dictionary Adam looked at, who knows. And in, the co in our code, what this is, is ways that bugs enter our code, ways that we don't guard against the wickedness of bugs getting into our code. So let's have an example. So let's say I have the number 12 somewhere in my code. The question comes, 12 what? What does this 12 actually mean? And there are different constraints depending on the meaning here. So like, is it 12 AD, the year 12 AD? Well, that has some meaning. It means you could have negative years, I guess, if they are representing times before AD, like BC. It also means you probably have some funky handling around the BC AC divide, because there's kind of like a 33, 35 year gap, so that's not really covered in the calendar. And there's various calendar reformations and that which are gonna mess up the meanings of this number. So representing a year as an integer is opening yourself up to a, a lot of issues, a lot of problems. What does it mean to take away 13 from this? Do you get to minus one BC or do you get to some kind of uh, date that we don't really have a name for? What if you had 12 bits? Right, so well bits can only be positive, zero or positive. You can't have negative bits. That doesn't really make sense um, in most applications, at least we're talking about a computer. Maybe it makes sense in information theory. Um, you probably have some other constraints here, like, for example, if you're talking about a computer, maybe when you get to 8 bits, you want to turn that into a byte type. Maybe you're talking about the word size in your computer, 64 bits, so anything more than 64 bits is not a valid um, number to have here. So there's some more constraints in there. <coughs> what does this mean? 12 kittens. Well, kittens, of course, are always positive. No evil introduced by k kittens. But perhaps they introduce capriciousness and uh, holes in your curtains, as they did for me. But again, there are constraints here, of course, that um, kittens must be greater than zero, zero greater, and I think 12 kittens is probably pushing the limit of how many kittens you'd want to have in one spot at once. So these are all issues you would have if you're just using the unadorned type int. What are you actually representing here? What are the constraints? It's very rare that you actually want to represent integer 32 bits Two's complement, and away you go. So integer is evil, int is evil. It's a way that bugs can get into our code, and we want to guard against that. Let's have another example. Let's say representing dates. Um, this is something you probably do in, like, say, JSON, which is a very impoverished format. It has no representation of dates. except have strings, so here you are using strings. And you've got some nice IEEE format. I can't remember the number that goes with it for representing dates. So it all seems good. So you can represent a date like this, or you can represent a date like that. There are lots of different ways of representing dates. Well, and here we go, it's a perfectly fine representation of a date, but it's not actually a valid date. February the 31st doesn't exist in our calendar. Okay, so that's one sort of source of problems you can have. Another thing, well, this is a nice format. You can represent time zones. So you really need to put a time zone on. Um, plus two, that's Berlin, plus zero, back where I live in the UK. And um, you have lots of various options here, a bit of complexity. 
And you get this kind of problem if you don't actually specify uh, like the time zone, then it'd be interpreted in the user's time zone. We have different time zones. If you're living in Germany, I'm in the UK, then we have different time zone. So again, failing to specify this <coughs> is a way of letting bugs into your program. So I see that unadorned strings are another way that evil sneaks in to our program. OK, let's look at something else. I've just used a, uh, a type alias here to give a little bit of meaning to um, what we're doing. So let's say we're doing something with a CSV. We're generating CSV data. And we're going to turn our list of CSV columns into um, a row of CSV. So we just get our list, concatenate a bunch of commas between all the elements, and away we go. That seems nice. But again, we've got a problem here. And that problem is we haven't worried about quoting or the other kind of other issues you get with CSV. So if someone passes in this string, oops, we now have a four column CSV row when we expected to have a three column one. So a list of string is really evil because you've got two things in there. You've got a uh, list type, which often represents more than you want. Do you really want to have this CSV row of any kind of arbitrary size? And uh, you've got string as well. So the general problem we have here um, is that working with primitive types, they're generally too broad. They represent too many possible values. They don't constrain the, the values to the actual uh, the domain that we're working with. And by doing that, they allow us to make mistakes. Let me say bugs will sneak it. There's a bug right there sneaking in in this string. I should say bugs will sneak in. So what we really want to do is we want to make it impossible to represent these invalid values. Invalid states are sometimes in call. Make it impossible to construct them. Give the set of legal values a name, which is a type. And then we only construct values of the type of interest. So if we're really dealing with kittens, they're going to be positive that numbers. If we're really dealing with years, then we probably need to have some uh, smart handling of them, distinguishing between AD and BC and so on. And what we're going to see is that this is actually fairly hard to do correctly. So let's look at some techniques for doing this. So types. Take as an example a UUID. Who's used UUIDs in their code? OK, most hands are going up. So you basically know what they are. They're 128 bits. Um, they are generally unique. For all practical purposes, they're unique, except when they're not. Um, and yeah, they're very useful for representing things like database keys and that, because they're not necessarily sequentially allocated. They don't leave you open to people attacking um, your database by ripping through an ordered sequence. And they're also useful in things like distributed systems and so on. You can add new nodes to your eventually consistent cluster if you want to do that type of thing. And you don't need to renumber everything because you've used some kind of naive hashing algorithm. Uh, so UIDs, useful thing. You've all used them, it seems. So that's great. Now, the typical way of representing them in uh, our computer is we normally have like a kind of string, like we've seen up here, some kind of string representation. Um, so what we might think is, well, you know, the easiest way to do that is just to declare a type alias, type UUID equals string. Now, um, if you're going to do virtually nothing to improve your code base from using string, this is probably the first thing you can do. Now, the great thing about having like this type alias is that most people are OK adopting them. You're not introducing a new technique to your coworkers. You're probably not going to get a lot of pushback. You can probably get people to do this. And it does provide a benefit. It provides a bit of documentation to the reader saying, hey, this is not a string, it's UUID. So they might think, well, I should only do like UUID things to them. I shouldn't be concatenating strings here, concatenating UIDs, for example. It's nonsensical. The big problem here, though, is that as far as the compiler is concerned, UUID, UUID and string are the same thing. So it's not going to prevent you from concatenating UUIDs. It's not going to warn you when you're using them incorrectly. So this is really only a hint to the programmer. It's not going to get the compiler to help you avoid bugs. But nonetheless, 
if you do nothing else, this is probably a good good first step. Right. So the next kind of real uh, step might be, say, creating like a case class. OK, so we're going to wrap up our strings in new UIDs, uh, and away we go. It's a very, very basic thing to do. I think most Scala programs are happy with case classes. We've actually got something the compiler will check, and you have to have a little bit more attention to the way you're manipulating it. Still not very powerful, though. When you construct one of these, you're not checking that the um, string you're putting in there actually is a valid UUID. There's nothing preventing people from just pulling that string out and doing naughty things to it. Um, and we're adding some runtime overhead. So now we have to allocate not just the string, but this wrapper for it, this case class wrapper. So we're adding a bit of overhead there, about 16 bytes for each um, kind of basic object in Java or on the JVM, I should say. So one thing we might think of is, well, can we remove this runtime overhead? Um, we can maybe extend any val like so. And this is basically just like the case class we saw earlier, but now in theory, we don't have any, we don't have the runtime overhead, but in practice, we're very unlikely to see much benefit from this. So although uh, any val was introduced to void runtime overhead, and in some cases it does, my experience is it doesn't really uh, give you much benefit in terms of runtime overhead. So um, I'd say any val's in the toolbox, but it's not really something I find too too useful. So we're not going to talk too much about um, what comes next. So a lot of the techniques I'll show you can use um, extending any val. All right. So let's move on to something that's actually going to um, give us some, some real benefit. So what we do here is we make the constructor private. And now you can only construct UIDs by going through this, this method, the apply method here. So this returns an option of a UUID. So it's indicating, well, maybe I can construct a UUID from the string you give me, or maybe it's an invalid string. I'm going to give you none back instead. And then you have to do something. So if we try to construct like that, it doesn't work. If we try to construct it like this, hopefully we'll get back like none in this case. So you're making explicit to the programmer that if you go from a string to a UUID, you could be making a mistake. And you need to think about what you do in the case of an error. So that's good. Um, one problem with case classes is that you still have the copy constructor available. You can still call copy and put sneak in some invalid values that way. <laughs> that's a really evil laugh there. <laughs> I like it. Um, you'd have to go to a little bit of effort to do that, but it's, it's still a possibility. So we'd like to guard against it. So just running down the pros and cons, um, we've got one place where we're validating our input, which is great. You can't create invalid UUIDs by, by construction. But you can still copy them and mess them up. And the other thing is you've got these options all over your code. And to some extent, that's possibly unavoidable. But at least in the case where you have like a literal UUID, if you have such a thing, it'd be nice to be able to avoid having to validate that, or maybe to validate it at compile time. So that's. That's an issue we have here. So let's move on to our next technique. I think everything I've shown here is probably fairly standard. This where it becomes a little bit odd. Sealed abstract case class UUID. Who's seen this before? Hey, a few people have. That's cool. OK. So it's a bit of a brain bender when you first see it. What does it actually do? But if you uh, sort of apply. You can reason about it. So sealed means you cannot extend this case class except for in, this, in the file it's defined. Abstract means you cannot instantiate this case class directly. The case class means it's a case class. So it's got the, um, the usual kind of pattern matching stuff on it. Um, and you know, the equals and hash code and so on. So we can only extend it in this file. We can't instantiate this, this case class directly, because abstract, so it has no constructor. Um, and it's not going to get a copy method either. So the other thing, you, you, can, you can extend a case class with a, a class or an anonymous class, for example. So in this file, we can actually construct instances. So in an apply method, which is the thing we had before, we can construct a subclass. Normally, we do it anonymously, just by going you know, new. Um, 
the new UUID if you construct an anonymous subtype and we can construct an instance here. We don't have a copy method anymore. So uh, that's good. So this kind of strange construction is essentially a way of getting a private constructor and removing the copy method. That's what it gives us. It's a little bit goofy. Welcome to Scala. That's how we roll. So um, what do we do? Well, it's got all the, the, uh, the benefits of what we did before with the case class and the private constructor. Now we don't have the copy method. We're not leaking that anymore. Uh, the bad parts are, one is you may have to explain to your coworkers what this thing is. That could be an issue. You could get some pushback there about people um, introducing this. I like to think it's not too crazy when you, when you understand it, and I hope the, it didn't take too long to explain. Um, and still, we have these options everywhere, which is annoying when we have uh, literals in our code. We'd like the compiler to check those for us. All right. This is the end of what we're going to talk about, our basic techniques for validating, uh, for creating safe data in um, Scala. So this is stuff you can do with the tools you have now without introducing anything that's going to get too much pushback from your colleagues. Let's move on now to um, functions. OK, so the other part, this is we looked at creating data. Now we're going to look at making our functions safer. Um, so we go to this bit of a typo, a bit of a rendering bug there. Um, so the example we've seen here, can, can all strings be converted to UUIDs? And the answer, of course, is no, they cannot. So when you have this situation, when the input type is bigger than the output type, so there are elements of the input type that don't map to the output type somehow, one way to handle this, of course, is to widen the output type. So instead of returning a UID, we return an option. This avoids the only other thing you could do in the situation is ready to throw an exception, and that's not, that's not visible to the type checker. It's not visible to the program as a result. You're relying on the program to check if an exception is being thrown. So this is what we've done in the previous example, where you have the constructor returning an option. OK, so um, this is like a good general technique if you have what's called a partial function. A function is not defined on its entire input, so that's a partial function in, in the mathematics sense, not in the Scala sense, which is a slightly different thing. Then um, you can get rid of that sort of partiality, if you like it, by widening the output type to include these error case. So a good general technique, but maybe we can go a little bit further. So the first thing we want to do is to um, say, well, a string is basically a list of characters. OK, so we just make this transformation list of characters, not adding anything here, just helping us on the road that we'll be going. Now, something we know for sure when you're creating a UID is you can't create one from the empty string. So we can add that constraint in into the type system a non-empty list of characters. And this is a type you'll find in cats, or a type you can find in um, Scala Z as well, I think. So it's not uh, something which is too esoteric, not something that you have to look too far to find. So OK, so we've got rid of at least one possible error there, the empty string. And the next thing to say is, well, this is not a list of characters, any old character. It's a list of hex digits. So we could define a type for that, just a simple sort of enumeration. You know, 1 to 9, 0 to 9, A to F. Those are the only valid types. And then we've got rid of a whole, new, whole class of errors. You can't put crazy Unicode characters in here anymore and expect stuff to work. So narrowing the input type down further. And if we could uh, completely narrow down the input type, well, it has to be 32 hex digits. Um, and that, not, that rendering bit is a bit annoying. We would then we could remove the option. Because if we can constrain down the input type to exactly match the things we can actually construct, then we, could, we wouldn't have this um, issue anymore. So general technique for handling for functions to make them safer, um, to have less errors, is consider, do you need to widen the output type? Are there more? Things in the input type then can be represented in the output, in which case maybe widen it by returning an either or an option. Or even better, can you, if that's the case, can you narrow down the input type so there are not so many uh, inputs there which are invalid and get rid of some of them? And if you can um, 
do that far enough, then you can get rid of that widening on the output. It's no longer, because errors are no longer possible in this way. All right. So that's basic techniques for um, handling these, these issues. Now I want to switch and look at a library for refinement types. So this is something that's a little bit further from what we've been talking about. It's not sort of core Scala anymore, but it is something you can download and you can use in your code today. So what is a refinement type? Refinement type is a type along with some kind of predicate. Uh, so you take a basic type, you refine it with a predicate, and we assume the predicate holds for any member of this refined type. And uh, you can grab the library from here, fThomas refined. Okay, so let's see an example. What does this look like? Here's a, uh, a very simple example. int refined positive. You can probably read that, but let's go through it. What it means, it's saying the base type is int, is refined by the predicate positive. And you can imagine that means any int greater than zero. So a great type for representing kittens, because we say kittens are always positive. Okay. Now, one of the things that's really nice about this is we could check this at compile time. So we don't have these options or either's everywhere in our code anymore, at least not for literals. We can't just run uh, to values which we only know at runtime, but certainly for our li literals like this, got rid of that, that error case. So it doesn't compile anymore if the code is incorrect, which is great. The other thing that's nice is that we have mostly no runtime overhead. I say mostly because there can be cases, I think primitive types can get boxed. Um, I'm not sure of all the details of performance, but I know that primitives will be boxed. So this will probably be boxed, but other types won't be. So when we have like a, an invalid literal, like minus five, we get five greater than zero. That happens at compile time. Now, what about at runtime? Uh, so at runtime, well, we don't know what x is. We need to refine it, and this could um, introduce an error case. So in this case, we're getting back an either a, st a string telling us about the error, or we get the refined int back. And, this, and 42 works, so it's going to be right. So we still have to um, <coughs> have this possibility of error in our code when we're not dealing with literals. But I don't really see um, a way around that. Hopefully, we can push these out to the edges of our system. Um, once, because once you've refined the type, you, of course, that, that type holds, and you know that you've got something which is positive. So you only need to do this refinement at the boundaries. So how expressive um, are these refinement types? Let's have a look at some examples. OK, so um, some things you get, you get like out of the box trimmed strings if you want to Know that have no uh, spaces around them. You can have negations of predicates, like so we have not trimmed string here. Um, you have hex string, so this handle out could use to handle our case for UIDs uh, to some extent. Um, yeah, SHA is 256, so um, very close to the UID example. Again, and this is all being checked at compile time for these literals. Regular expressions, which I think is pretty cool. And then um, an interesting example of like defining a much more complex predicate, specifying a number is uh, between 0 and 1. So we're saying it's not greater than 1, and it's not less than 0. And uh, you've got a little bit of a kind of a rendering <laughs> bug in here in these slides, because uh, cause, yeah, types are evil. So that's. Um, so all the ones above 0 to 1 are all things you uh, come out of the box with refined, and then 0 to 1 is something that we construct ourselves from the tools it gives us. And you can see you can express very, ex very um, expressive things here. So that's pretty cool. So um, a recap. Refined is checking, checking the literals at compile time, but you're still checking the values at runtime. So you still have those, in this case, either is getting in there, probably better than option, because it tells you why it failed. And the, one of the best things about this is you can compose the predicates to create more more complex predicates. So if we wanted to, we could create a predicate that expresses like the UUID type that we had, 32 hex digits, and we could construct out the primitive. So there's, there's effectively no limit to what you can do here. 
it just comes down to how big do you like the types to be in your code and um, how much compile time you're prepared to accept as well. All right. So to recap, again, this is a library you can download, you can use. It does provide a lot of extra security into your types. It's a bit more of a stretch to get to um, for the average programmer, but I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's crazy. I don't look at this and wonder what's going on. Now let's move on to something which uh, is not available yet, but hopefully will be available soon. And these are opaque types. So opaque types are defined in SIP35. Anyone looked at that? Okay, a few hands going up. Cool. So uh, you know the basic idea here. You can think of opaque types as basically being any val, extends any val value classes, done done right for some definition of right. Uh, certainly, that properties I, I like. So the syntax uh, looks like this. Def you define a type alias in Scala. We saw that before. Type UUID equals string, but you now you stick opaque in front of it. And then you need to have a companion object, which defines some, some methods. So here we have a constructor, just like we saw before. Um, apply string. And you get back your option of UUID. So that's nice. So what in particular do we get from opaque types? Well, you can get safe construction, um, which is great. The companion object is the only place you can construct them, as I understand it. Um, and most importantly, they have no runtime overhead. So we had all the other situations we had, possibly some runtime overhead with opaque types when they're implemented. Um, we'll hopefully get no runtime overhead. I believe uh, if you want to use so type tags, there's a very similar technique called type tags. It has no runtime overhead. I think that's where the um, opaque type works comes from. But I'm not going to talk about type tags too much. So uh, these opaque types really answer a lot of the problems we've had. You can construct them safely, no runtime overhead, and you can see how you can mix them with, say, something like refined to uh, um, construct them at compile time from literals without errors. Is there a hand going up there? No, OK. All right. The the big um, downside, of course, is that they're not available yet. I think you can you can fake them yourself to a large extent by using um, this type tag technique, which I haven't talked about. But um, opaque types themselves are not not available anywhere that I'm I'm aware of. I don't know if they are scheduled to be included in Scala yet. So they're, they're a great thing, in, in my opinion, solve a lot of these issues, but not quite there. So let's see a summary of what we looked at. Um, so the main point is that primitive types, although they are useful because they correspond to some sort of basic things that the computer works with now, they're normally much too wide, much too broad, cover far too many values for our typical uses. Like we don't have unsigned integers in Scala a lot of the time, you really do want unsigned, unsigned integers, and you can't represent that safely in an integer. Strings, of course, the other place that you just throw all sorts of random garbage. Um, classic JavaScript sort of stuff. If you program in JavaScript, you've probably seen the problems. And of course, we have the same problems in Scala. We can have them. And the solution is to wrap them with our own types. And we've seen various ways of doing that. So the case class, case class, the private constructor, the sealed abstract case class, and that's um, probably the technique that's most accessible to people. And if you want to go that step further, you can use this refined library, and then you have um, reduced runtime overhead, and you can get away with uh, um, checking your literals at compile time. So a very nice thing to use. The other thing we looked at was uh, when you're working with functions, think about the types that are going in and the types that are going out. Widen the output type of your uh, your function if the input has more values than can be represented in the output. Or better yet, consider narrowing the input type so that you avoid these possibilities of errors. And uh, finally, so we have refinement types, we looked at them. They're a technique you can use right now to make your code better. They're very flexible predicates you can express with refinement types. And uh, hopefully in the future, we can use opaque types as well. All right.
Thanks. Mm.